Our Father in heaven, Lord, as always, we love you, Lord. We thank you this morning, Lord God. There is no one like you. Lord, we need you. I truly believe more than ever. I, I really do. And so be with us, Lord God. Be with your people, Lord God. As we open up our Bibles, Lord God, as I always pray, open up our hearts, speak to us. Whether we're here in this building, Lord God, or, or whether we're at home or on our phones or wherever we might be, again, tuning in online, your word says you'll never leave us nor forsake us. We know that you're with us, Lord, and so speak to us. Open up our hearts, Lord God. Show us things. Teach us. Remind us of who you are, your great love for us, that we would come to know you, Lord God, in a more close and intimate way. Lord, we need you in these last days, and so I'm just, I'm just grateful, Lord, that we have you, that we can turn to you, and I pray, Lord, be with us now. Bless our time in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good to see everyone this morning. Again, if you have a Bible, which I hope you do, let's turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 9. The Gospel of Luke chapter 9. Again, I hope you guys have your Bible before you. Again, I, I hope you guys have your Bible. If you're tuning in, on, in online, I always encourage a little notepad. Again, take some good notes. You want to learn these things. These are, these are life lessons that God has for us every time we open up God's Word. And so Luke chapter 9, again, we'll begin in a few moments, picking up right where we left off in verse 10. But I'll kind of begin this way as, again, knowing you know, where the Lord is leading us this morning. There's so many different religions in the world. Ancient religions against religions that are still practiced today. And, and any of you who have ever took the time to study religions in school and college, again, maybe in, just in your own study, will find something very interesting. The majority of all of these religions, both past and present, believe in so many different gods. Some, again, like the Buddhists, believe in 330 million different gods. Interesting, okay? Interesting. But of all these gods, one of the interesting things that you find is that most of the gods that these people believe in are indifferent. In other words, they're wrapped up in their own being, supposedly. They don't really care about man. Some believe that, again, their gods created man, but, but they have left man to himself. They are indifferent and even uncaring. Some even believe that their gods are mean and cruel and have no love. Now, when I think about it again, it makes me that much more grateful that we serve a good, loving God. Isn't that right? Seriously. I mean, it really does. It really does. Recognizing that we serve the one and only true God, the true creator, as the song says, right, of heaven and earth, who does love us, who did not create us and leave us to ourselves, but, but has a role, a desire, a hope, and a purpose for every single one of our lives. It reminds me again to be that much more thankful every day that we serve a good God. A God that we can turn to again when things are hard, like the way we see in this world today. Now, God, as I said already, again, has revealed himself through his word. And, and one of the things that we find earlier on in the Bible, you don't have to turn there, but I'll show you again, taken from the book of Exodus again. God revealed himself to Moses, and I love what he declared to Moses because Moses was to write this down so that all of us would come to know God in this way. In Exodus 34, 6 and 7, it says, The Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, this is God talking about himself. I love it. He says, The Lord, the Lord, a God of merciful, he's a God of mercy, and gracious, he's a God of goodness, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. How many of you love that God, right? That merciful and good and forgiving God. That's the God that I love. That's the God that I serve. Now, we not only see this about God, again, revealing himself to us, to Moses, but as we've studied the life of Jesus, We've seen God and his love illustrated. We've seen his compassion illustrated. Again, through the life of Jesus, through just looking at Jesus. I mean, Jesus said, right, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's who he is. He is the Son of God and God the Son. And as we studied his life, we've seen this love and this mercy and this compassion. And what amazes me, especially if you've been with us, is we have seen Jesus rejected. We have seen Jesus hated. Again, by his own people, 
people. And yet day after day, despite their rejection of him, he loved them and he ministered to them, right? He met their needs daily, over and over and over again. Even though they gave him no love, he returned love back to them. And this is so beautiful. Again, we see this great love of God. Jesus did all of this because he desired that people would know how much their God loves them. That people would know that he is there for them. And get this, that people would know he is able to meet their need. Okay, He is able to meet their need. And he did all this because he desired again that they would come to know him in that incredible way. Now, as someone who's been serving Jesus again for 30 years now, I can tell you that God has met my needs, right? God has been good to me. No, I'm not rich. No, I don't live in a big house or drive a fancy car, but God has met my needs, okay? He is there. He is faithful to do that. And I believe you can say the same thing. The Apostle Paul talks about this in Philippians 4.19. Paul encouraged the church. He says that my God, right, can supply how many of your needs? Oh, I love you. How many of you love that word all, right? All, all your needs. How can he do it? According to his riches. How many of you know our God's not broke, right? He can do it. He's got the power. He's got more than can meet our needs. But notice, how does he do it? By Christ Jesus. You guys see that? That's very important. He is able to meet our needs through his son who created all things. Jesus is able to do this. And I want to remind you of that because that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. That Jesus is able to meet your need. Do you believe that? He's able to meet your need. Again, we're going to see that this morning. Now, according to Matthew 6.32, Jesus said that God knows what we need. And I love that. And I want you to remind yourself every time that you're struggling, every time that you feel yourself in need, that God knows, that God understands And along with understanding, he's able to do it, right? Praise the Lord for that. He is able to do it. Now, you might ask, why does he do this? Why does he do this? Why is God so good to me? How many of you have ever experienced the goodness of God and thought to yourself, I don't know why he did this for me, right? I don't know why. Seriously, it happens to me all the time, guys. Well, Paul says in Romans 2.4 that it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. That when we understand how good he is, how can we not want to serve him, right? How can we not want to run to him? How can we not want to jump into his arms? Well, this morning, we're going to be reading about a miracle, and it's a very important miracle. Get this. Jesus did tons of miracles recorded in the Bible. This is the only miracle recorded in all four gospels. Would you say that's got to be pretty important? It's the only one, other than the resurrection, that is recorded in all four gospels and it's in here again so that we would see the great love and compassion and ability that Jesus has to meet the needs of those again who come to him. If you're taking notes and you like stuff like this, write down again Luke 9, Matthew 14, Mark 6 and John 6, because this passage we're about to cover, and I'm going to go back and forth because I want you to get the full picture, is recorded again in all four Gospels. It is what's known as the feeding of the 5,000, okay? Some of you know it as the story of the loaves and the fishes, okay? That's what we're going to be looking at in our text this morning. Now, before we jump right in again, as I always do just to bring everyone up to speed, you need to know why Jesus did this at this specific time. Okay, over the last year and a half, if you've been with us, right, not in our time, but in Jesus's time, Jesus had a three-year ministry. And thus far up into chapter nine, he's covered the first half. He's covered that first 18 months. During these 18 months, Luke has recorded for us miracle after miracle, teaching after teaching, all that Jesus was doing in ministering to the needs of the people. Everything Jesus did, specifically doing things that only God could do, Jesus did to bring the people to faith in him so that they would come to understand he truly is the Messiah. He truly is the son of God and God the son. And so he taught day after day. He did miracle day after day. The sad part is that even after everything he did, even after 18 months, 
the majority of people still rejected him. They still, again, did not believe he truly was who he claimed to be. Now, it's interesting, again, after these 18 months, what you need to understand is Jesus spent the majority of this time in northern Israel, okay? We call it the area of the Galilee. It's the area surrounding the Sea of Galilee. All his time during this first half of his three-year ministry was spent there. These are the city of Nazareth where he grew up, the city of Nain. This is Capernaum. This is Tiberias. Again, these are a lot of the cities that we've covered thus far. And he spent all this time up there ministering to all these people. This is a big population of Israel in northern Israel in the Galilee region, okay? But his time there was now coming to an end. After this, Jesus is going to leave, and this is where we pick it up next week. He's going to leave, he's going to travel north, and then he's going to come right back down south. He's going to go to Jerusalem, and he's going to be crucified. And so, before he leaves, and I love this, right? I believe we serve a God, we serve a God of second chances. And we see that here. Because before Jesus leaves the Galilee region, he wants to give him one more chance, one more opportunity to receive him, to believe in him before he leaves, because he's not coming back. And so what he did, if you were with us last week, is he called the 12 apostles together, right? And he sent them out. The word apostle means sent ones. And he divides them in groups of two. He gave them supernatural power so that they could do the miracles he was doing. They, were already, they already knew the gospel he had been teaching, and he sent them out. And he called the blitz, that's what we would say. In football terms, it's a blitz as they were all spread out and they would cover the Galilee region over the next several weeks, some scholars say a couple months, giving the people in the villages and the towns one last chance to believe in Jesus. And that's what happened. That's what we covered last week. They went out, they taught, they did the miracles Jesus commanded them to do. And as we pick it up, they come back, okay? But get this, this is how we ended last week. Luke verses. Um, chapter 9, 7 through 9, these are our last three verses. Now Herod the Tetrarch, he was the governor, the governing ruler of the Galilee region. He heard about all that was happening, this massive missionary movement hitting all the towns and villages in rapid fire. And he was perplexed because it was said by some that John, this is John the Baptist, had been raised from the dead. By some that Elijah the prophet had appeared and by others that one of the other prophets of old had arisen. And Herod said, John I beheaded. He had just killed, murdered John the Baptist. And so he thought to himself, I just killed John. It can't be John. But then he said this, and this is very important. He says, but who is the this? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? About whom I hear such things, and he sought to see him. Now, the reason Jesus is going to do The biggest miracle of all. This miracle we're going to read about affects more people than any other miracle he had ever done at one time. And the reason he does it now is to answer that question. Herod wanted to know. The people were asking, who is he really? And Jesus wanted to show them again by doing the biggest miracle of all, right? This is the finale, we would say, literally before he leaves, that he is the Messiah that he is the one fully capable of meeting every one of man's needs. Remember, God meets our needs. He doesn't meet our greeds. Don't ever confuse that. But he is able, okay? He is more than able. And that's what we're going to see this morning in our text as we learn about the sufficiency of Christ, okay? The sufficiency of Christ, that he is more than able, that he is more than sufficient of meeting every one of our needs. If you're taking notes, again, we're covering Luke 9, 10 through 17 this morning. Again, we are going to see the Lord's compassion, the compassion of Christ, right, which causes him to provide for our need. It's his great love for us, right? He doesn't owe us anything, but he does it out of love and compassion for us. And the first need that God provides is the need for rest. And I love this one. The need for rest. He is there to provide rest for the weary. Let's begin this morning again as we pick up right where we left off again. Last week, verse 10, Luke chapter 9, Luke writes, On their return, the apostles told 
him, Jesus, all that they had done. And Jesus took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. Okay? Bethsaida. And so again, as we pick it up where we left off, the apostles returned. Again, they were in groups of two. The six groups returned. Jesus was also out there ministering. And so they all come back together. They are all together. And Jesus recognizes, because again, God knows our needs, that they were tired. That they had come back from a long couple weeks of hard work and and ministry, and Jesus recognized their need for rest. And so what does he do? He prescribes for them what they need. A little getaway, right? A little getaway. Now, what I love about this, if you were with us, if you've been with us, we have seen Jesus tired. Have we seen that? How many of you remember chapter four? At this time earlier, Jesus was doing all the work. And he had been doing all the work again to at one point, one day he was so exhausted. You guys remember? He says, let's get on a boat ride and go to the other side. And as soon as he got into the boat, the Bible says he put his head on a pillow and he was out. I mean, exhausted, okay? Any of you, and I encourage you, who have ever been on a missions trip can testify that doing the work of God is exhausting. Do you guys know that? If you've never been on one, and I really encourage, every Christian needs to get out there. Go to Mexico, go to an orphanage. Again, go to different places and serve people and love people and share the love of God with them. It is so important. It is so fulfilling. But one of the things that you will find when you go is when you come back, you're exhausted. I mean, spiritually, you're exhausted. Physically, you're exhausted. Emotionally, you're praying with people. You're crying with people. Again, it's exhausting. There's nothing like it. But when you come back, you're exhausted. I mean, I get, you guys know I was in Cuba right earlier in February. Loved it. We hit the ground running when we got there. I'd never forget the pastor told uh, me and Pastor Tony, he says, you guys want to get some rest? And we're like, no, man, let's do it. Let's go. Let's start visiting churches. And we literally are hitting church day after day after day. But when I got back, man, I slept like a, you know, like a bear or something like that because it, it, you need it. You need a vacation when you get back because it's so awesome and rewarding, but at the same time, Oh, it, it, it makes an impact. It makes an impact. And so I get this. Jesus got this. Jesus knew what it was about to serve people and to love people and to be exhausted. And he knew his disciples needed it, which is why Mark, again, shares the same thing. This is Mark's gospel and his perspective. Mark 6, 30, Mark says, the apostles returned to Jesus and told them all that they had done, the miracles, and taught. And Jesus said to them, come away by yourself. Come on, let's get away, guys. Notice, to a desolate place. Let's kind of go to the middle of nowhere and rest for a while. They were all tired. For many were coming and going, the people, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now, if you've been with us, I've shared before that Jesus' headquarters was the city of Capernaum, okay? This is where Peter lived. You can go there today, and actually Peter's house, again, it's covered and protective, but they believe Peter's house, again, is still there where Jesus stayed and did many of the miracles that he did. And so it's believed that when they all returned from the trip, they all met up likely in Capernaum. And it was there that Jesus said, come on, let's go. And so they jump in a boat on Capernaum, it's on the seashore of Galilee, and they make their way to a city, an area known as Bethsaida. If you have a pen and you like taking notes, the word Bethsaida means house of fish. It's a fishing village, that's that's what it is. And they made their way again in the boat towards Bethsaida. I'll kind of show you a map to give you some perspective. Capernaum, again, is located at 11 o'clock if you're close enough on the map. And by boat, it would have been only four miles. A four-mile trip by boat on the Sea of Galilee, again, to the area of Bethsaida, which is located on the eastern side of where the Jordan River pours into the Sea of Galilee. And so again, just to give you some perspective, if you've ever been to Israel again, you get to go here. You get to see all that you see. Now, as I think about it, one of the things that I can agree with, and I hope you'll agree with, is boat rides are relaxing. How many of you like boat rides, right? Seriously, I like boat rides. I don't have a boat or anything like that. But on the times when I've been able to get on a boat and just sit back and allow the wind to blow, you guys with me? It's awesome. It feels good. It's refreshing. 
When you go to Israel, again, one of the highlights of the trip every time I go, I've been there four times now, is to ride on a boat on the Sea of Galilee. It's just part of the trip. And it's just, it's, my, it's one of my highlights. You're just able to enjoy it and think about the Lord and imagine, again, the Lord being on the boat, sailing with the disciples. It, it is, it, it's awesome. There's nothing like it. My point this morning is that they needed rest. And Jesus knew they needed rest. And Jesus provided for their rest because that's what he does. How many of you remember again what he said earlier in Matthew eleven twenty eight? 28? He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? I'll give you rest. Those that are tired and tired of being tired, Jesus promises rest. He can give you the rest that you're looking for. You just got to come to him. That's exactly what, again, he did for the disciples. It's what he did for the crowds, and it's what he'll do for us. Let's move to the second thing this morning again as we move on. First is the Lord's compassion causes him to provide rest for the weary, but he also provides truth for the lost. Write that down. Truth for the lost. Keep reading again. Book of Luke, verse 11. When the crowds learned it, when the crowds learned it, they followed him, okay? When the crowds learned what? Well, when the crowds learned that they had got into a boat and started sailing, right, on the Sea of Galilee, it says they followed him, meaning that they followed him along the seashore. They seen him get in the boat. Hey, there he goes. And you can imagine a crowd, little by little, right, following after him. They see the direction that he was heading into. It was only four miles by boat, by water, but it's only eight miles, if I showed you the map again, from Capernaum to Bethsaida. It's it's far, but it's not that far. It was doable. And so many of the crowds, again, began to follow him on foot. As a matter of fact, Mark tells us in Mark 6.33, now many saw them going and recognized them. And they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. I mean, again, they're taking their time on the boat, enjoying a nice relaxing boat ride. And the crowds, again, they get there ahead of time. Now, as I read this, I, it, it almost makes me laugh a little bit. I try to put myself in the shoes of the apostles. How many of you know they were tired, right? They wanted to get away from the people. They wanted some rest, right? Maybe some time with Jesus by themselves, but we read here, the crowds wouldn't leave them alone, right? The crowds wouldn't leave them alone. Now again, they had just spent weeks after weeks after weeks ministering to people. Maybe in their minds, they felt like, hey, we deserve a break, right? We deserve to be left alone, but that's not what happened. Because as I imagine, they're on the boat, right? And they're looking at the seashore and there's probably people waving. You guys get the picture, right? People waving, It says that it started with many, and as the many began to go towards Bethsaida, many others began to join them, right? Maybe family or friends. Hey, we're following Jesus. How many of you love the movie Rocky? You guys with me? It started off with a slow crowd, right? And then at the end, it's a massive crowd, literally. It's a massive crowd. And the the poor disciples, if I can be honest, they see it. They know break time is over. I mean, again, there's a massive crowd waiting for them. Now, I have to be honest. I have to be human. And I have to think to myself, I wonder if they began to get a little annoyed at the people, right? They're tired. They wanted a break. They wanted some rest. I wonder if they began to feel a little resentful towards the people for not allowing them again to have that rest. Again, I just, I have to be honest. They might have felt that way, but regardless of how they felt, what amazes me is what Jesus did, okay? It's not about what we feel, it's about what we do. Look at what Jesus did. Keep reading. It says, and he welcomed them. Now remember, Jesus was tired too. He was on that missionary journey as well, but he welcomed them, I love it, and spoke to them of the kingdom of God. Jesus was tired. He needed a break. He, again, but he still took the time to teach them and to share with them and to minister to them. Again, according to Mark, Mark 6, 34, when Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd. This is a great crowd now. 
and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Now, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, the phrase sheep without a shepherd is very common. It was often used to describe, again, the helplessness of the children of Israel. If you know anything about sheep, if you've ever studied sheep, sheep are believed to be one of the most helpless animals, okay? It's said that if a sheep falls on its back, it doesn't even know how to get up. This is the truth. This is what I read. It will stay on its back. It will starve to death without a shepherd. This is the helplessness, the hopelessness of sheep. And Jesus, I love it, felt compassion upon people because he recognized without a shepherd, they're going to die. Without a shepherd, they are lost. Without a shepherd, they can't live. And his love for them, his, his care for them, his compassion for them drove him, motivated him again to look out for them and to minister to them because he recognized just how much in need of him they were. Now, again, I wonder what went through, what went through the disciples' head, right? They probably were hoping where Jesus was going to say, hey, guys, we're on break, right, or something like that. But they seen Jesus respond. He was showing them something. He wanted them to, to learn. One day, Jesus is going to be gone, wasn't he? And he wanted them to learn that compassion, that love for other people, that if they call themselves children of God, that they too needed to have the same love for other people. What a lesson for us, huh? I know, again, and I'm human just like you guys. Don't get me wrong. I, I love personal space, right? I love being alone. You know, I love teaching God's word. I love being around people. But oftentimes, sometimes, because I'm human, it gets overwhelming, right? And I need to, you know, kind of do one of those things. And there have been many times where God checks me, right? I'm dealing with people, I'm praying for people, I'm counseling people, and all of a sudden I get home and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm ready to you know, cut open my, or cut my tuna sandwich in half and my phone rings. And I'm like, man, I just left church. You know, one of, the, you know, one of those things, right? right? It happens, it happens. But I'm reminded that, you know what? God checks us. God checks our heart. Lord, help us, Right? Jesus allowed himself to be interrupted. If I call myself a Christian, I need to do the same thing. This is what God expects, right? And it's hard. Again, I, I, I get it. I get it. Trust me. No one has to tell me. I get it. I, I, I understand. But I love the fact that we see the love of God here, right? What it truly means to be open and to care about other people and to learn to make ourselves available to those that are in need. Number one, again, Jesus, again, provides rest for the weary. Number two, he provided truth for the lost. And number three, healing for the sick. Again, this is what else we see in our small passage. Again, look at the third thing this morning. Keep reading uh, verse 11. It says, and he cured those who had need of healing. In other words, he also met the needs of the sick. He was busy, right? He was busy. Now remember, Jesus' number one focus is the teaching of God's word. Isn't that right? How many of you agree that's the most important thing? It's the most important thing. Why? Because faith comes by hearing the word of God. The most important thing every person on planet earth needs is the word of God, okay? The bread of life. This is truly what we need. But even though Jesus' main priority was teaching, knowing there were people that were sick, he still took the time to minister to their needs. This is interesting. Let me show you something. According to John, John 6, 2, it says, and a large crowd was following him, same event, because they saw the signs that he was doing. Now, I show you this for a reason. When Jesus saw the crowd, when he saw the crowd following him along the seashore, he knew they weren't coming for, to hear the word of God. He knew the main reason the majority of those people were coming was to have their physical need met. He knew that. But he still took care of it. 
I'll say it this way. Even though he knew they weren't coming to him for the, for the right reason, he still took care of it because that's his great love for us. And I want to remind everybody, this is really, really important. One of, the, one of the things that happens from time to time is I'm called upon to pray for people at hospitals or pray for people that are sick. And people are focused on having their physical need met. Now, I understand that's important. But I want to remind everyone, and I want to especially remind you, because you might find yourself here. As important as it is to have a physical need met, I do believe God can heal. God can do anything. But even if you have cancer and God heals you, do you understand it's only temporary? You're still going to die. We're all going to die. Which means more important than physical healing is spiritual healing. Because spiritual healing provides salvation, which is not temporary. It lasts forever. This is why, again, when people say, Pastor, I have a loved one. Can you pray for them? I'm all for it. I'll add them to my prayer list. But more important than praying for their physical healing, I pray for their spiritual healing. Because I want to see them in heaven. Amen? And so should you. But again, even though Jesus knew these people were like so many today, more focused on the physical than the spiritual. He still took the time to meet their needs. We see it here, right? He gave them rest to those who needed it, right? He gave truth to those who needed it. He gave healing and health to those who needed it, which brings us to our fourth and last one this morning. He gave food for the hungry, right? He even cares about our physical hunger. I love it. Look at verse 12. Now the day began to wear away and the 12 came and said to him, send the crowd away. Can you imagine that, right? To go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodging and get provisions for we are here in a desolate place. Now, I want to remind you that this little trip, this little getaway that Jesus and his disciples made, it wasn't planned, right? The disciples didn't know about it. Certainly no one in the crowd knew about it. Remember, it just happened. They all got back on a certain day, and they jumped in a boat, and the crowd seen them, and the crowd began to follow them. It happened just like that. No one had time to pack a sack lunch, right? No one had time to prepare, which means... Everyone makes their way over there, many of them traveling eight miles. They have enjoyed a wonderful day of ministry by Jesus. They have heard Jesus teach them the word of God. But now as the day began to get late, right? Maybe it's four, five o'clock. People are hungry. No one was prepared, right? No one had prepared a lunch. The disciples are hungry. I'm sure Jesus was hungry. And so what do the disciples do? They go to Jesus and they say, hey, Jesus, it's kind of getting late. It's probably a good idea to tell the people to go home. Tell them to go home before it gets any later so they can find a place to sleep and, and so they can find some food for themselves. Now, this was easy to do. Oftentimes we are, faced with a dilemma, we find ourselves around people who have needs, and the easiest thing to do is just to walk away, isn't it? Just to tell them, uh, hey, man, I hope it works out for you, right? What's the old saying? You got yourself into this mess. Hopefully, you can get yourself out. That's normal, isn't that? Isn't that human nature? Isn't that natural? This is how the disciples were, were feeling. Jesus, hey, you know... They should have packed a lunch. They should have been prepared. They did this to themselves. I mean, that was what they were saying in a nice way, right? Send them home. Send them home so they can, they can find themselves something to eat. I mean, Jesus, it's not our fault, right? They did this to themselves. That's natural thinking, right? That's human nature. I'm unfortunately... But let me ask you this. Can you imagine if Jesus had that attitude with us? Seriously, 
If he had this same attitude with us, that same, it's your own fault, oh, how many of us would be in trouble, right? But thank God this is not our Lord. Thank God again that he has love and compassion. It's a lot easier to send people away, right? It's a lot easier to say, hey, brother, I'll pray for you. But how many of us are willing to get our hands dirty? This is what this is about. Jesus wanted to teach his disciples a lesson. He wanted them to understand again that if we love people as God desires us to love them, we won't just send them away, but we will involve ourselves to be a part of the solution. This is the love of God. This is who Jesus is. Look what he says, verse 13. They come to him and say, send the crowds away. But he said to them, you, and I love the you, you guys, give them something to eat. You do it. I want you to do it. You need to do it. And I love that. Very, very important. I want to show you guys that this conversation started not with Jesus. It started with the disciples. Isn't that right? They were the ones that came to him and said, hey, Jesus, we see there is a need out there. We can't help. And so we should send the crowd away. But have you ever thought about this? Oftentimes God shows us things because he wants us to do something about it. You guys ever think about that? He shows us things. He opens our eyes. He makes us aware of needs of people around us. Not so that we can just go tell someone else to help, but so that we can get involved ourselves. One of the things that happens here, again, you guys know this, right? I say it all the time. This is not my church. This is our church. But when a toilet breaks, okay? When a urinal gets stuck, and this has happened several times, right? When things happen, People come to me, hey, pastor, uh, I just want to let you know that that thing is broken over there, and so you might want to get that fixed. Praise the Lord. Hey, see you next Sunday. (laughs) You don't know, I'm I'm going to be honest, you don't know how many times stuff like that's happened to me. And I think to myself, isn't it interesting that God showed that person the need? Maybe God wanted to use that person to get involved. Maybe God showed him instead of me because God wanted, again, them to play an active role in the solution. And I think this is an important lesson for all of us. God shows us because he's inviting us to join in. God wants to use our lives. He wants to use the talents and the skills and the gifts and the resources that he has provided for us to be used for his kingdom and for his people. That's what was happening here. God had showed the apostles the need, that these people had a need and they were to take it upon themselves to do what they could again to meet the need. And we know this because let me show you. According to John, again, John 6, 5, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people could eat? John includes this, that Jesus turns to Philip and he says, Philip, What can we do about it? Now, the interesting thing is the reason Jesus went to Philip is that Philip was from Bethsaida. You find this recorded in John 1, 44. This is, again, where Philip was from. He knew the area. And so Jesus turned to him, having someone who who knew the area, who lived there, who knew what resources would have been available. And he invites Philip to join in the work. Hey, Philip, what can you do? What can you bring to this? How can you be a part of the solution? Because again, this is what God does. Understand, this is a very important lesson for your Christian life, is that God is going to show you things. God is gonna put things on your heart. He's gonna show you needs of people. He's gonna show you burdens that people face, not so that you can just pray. Yes, you should pray, but you should do more than pray. You should get involved. You should meet the needs of those around you, right? Your neighbors, your classmates, your coworkers, whoever it is, because people are in need. 
people are in need. And that's what this was. That's exactly what this was. Giving the apostles that opportunity to join in so they could serve people, so they could help people. Now, what I love about this is what Philip didn't know is this was all a test. How many of you know God tests us? Right? Remember that. Next time a homeless person comes up and asks you for something, it might just be a test. Now, I'm not saying you should give to every homeless that asks you. That's between you and the Lord. But it might be a test. But it might be. How do we know it's a test? Again, Bible reveals it. John 6, 6. He said this to Philip to test him. Jesus was testing him for Jesus himself knew what he would do. How many of you know God has a plan? He has it figured out. He knows what he's doing. He knows how he's going to take care of it. Jesus knew how he was going to fix this problem all along. The disciples didn't know. And Jesus wanted to see what they would do, how they would respond. Remember, one day soon, Jesus is dead. The disciples would need to carry on the work. Would they have compassion on people? Would they love people? Would they serve people? Well, this is where they were learning, okay? This was that on-the-job training. Now, the beautiful thing about this is that there are many times in our life when even with everything we got, we are not sufficient to meet the need. Isn't that right? That's the truth, okay? I'm just a man. I've had, you know, one of the saddest things that's happened so many times, and it's so difficult. And I understand, but it's hard for me. But people have called me to hospital beds, and I prayed over people. And I know people are looking to me to do a miracle. I have no power. I have no power. God has the power. If God desires to heal, they'll be healed. If God desires to take them home, he's taking them home. Again, I believe there's power in prayer, but I don't have magic power. I understand that there are things that are just beyond me, okay? And you need to understand that too. But you know what? This is a good thing. This is a good thing when you recognize that you need God. That there are certain things that are impossible with man. But the Bible says what is impossible with man is possible with God. That's the lesson again. Jesus wanted his disciples to understand. Let me show you. Look what Jesus did. Mark 6.38, Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see, go find out. And when they had found out, they said, we have five loaves and two fish. Now, what I love about this, again, Jesus wants to drive this lesson home that there is too many people, that in and of themselves, they cannot meet the need. And the way he makes this crystal clear to them is he tells them, I want you to go out into the crowd and take up a collection plate and see how much food you can come up with. That's what this is about. He wants them to understand that naturally speaking, they can't meet the need. And so we get this picture that the disciples go out, they go amongst the 5,000 people, and they try to come up with how much food they can come up with. The only thing they come up with is a little kid's, you know, happy meal, right? It's like five loaves and two fish. That's it. A lunchable. That's it. Keep reading. Verse, uh, verse 13. They said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we are to go and buy food for all these people, for there were about 5,000 men. You guys see that? Underline the word men. 5,000 men. That's a lot of people. Five loaves. Think about breaking up five loaves. This is not a loaf of bread. This is like a uh, bolillo. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? And small little sardines. That's what this is. How are they possibly going to do this? And the answer is they're not. In and of ourselves, man cannot meet this need. But what this does is this set the stage for Jesus to show his power, for Jesus to show who he truly is, for him to do this greatest miracle of all and truly be the hero who can meet the needs of everyone who has it. Keep reading. And he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50. And they did so and had them all sit down. Now, I love this. I love this because 
There's no food. Not yet. We know the story. And yet Jesus says, look, we're going to eat. Have the people divide up in groups of 50 so we can easily distribute food to the right number. 5,000 men, it says. Disciples are like, okay. You have to wonder what's going through their head. What are we going to feed them, Jesus, right? But they do it anyway. You guys like that? How many of you know when God says to do something, we should do it anyway? Even if it did, we don't see it, even if we don't, it don't make sense in our mind, we need to do it anyway. And they were doing it anyway. They said, okay. And they began to get the people. And I love it. The people responded. In other words, they believed it too. They didn't see any food. They were probably thinking to the same thing. What food? Trust Jesus. He's, we're going to have food. And they did it. And they sat down. And they organized just as Jesus said. I love this definition. You guys might remember again from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 11.1 1 gives us a definition of what faith is. And, and let me read to you from the New Living Translation. Faith is the confidence that what we hope for, they were hoping for food, will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. I love that. Real simple. That's what faith is. We don't see it, but we believe it, right? We hope for it, and because God says it, we trust that it's, it's, it's going to happen. And that's exactly what these people did. They had faith in Jesus. Verse 16, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. Notice, and they all ate and were what? What does it say? Satisfied. I love that word, sad. How many of you like feeling satisfied, right? What a word. I love this. Jesus, again, takes the food that had been given to him, the, the five loaves and the two fish, looks it up to heaven, right? Blesses the Father for providing the food. And then as, again, the Father begins to multiply the food in Jesus' hands, Jesus begins to give out the food to the disciples. They became waiters. And they began to deliver the food, right? And he kept giving, and he kept giving, and he kept giving so that everyone ate, and they were all satisfied. Now, what's amazing about this, and this is, this is pretty powerful. How many of you know in America, we eat a lot of food? You guys know that, right? We, need, we eat a lot of food. But do you know if you travel to other countries, they don't eat a quarter as much as we do? In the United States, we've invented something that is almost embarrassing. It's called all you can eat. You guys know that? Do you know that you don't find that in anywhere else in the world? That's a American thing because we love to eat. Most people in the world don't eat till they're satisfied. That's the truth. And what's amazing is that most scholars believe that this might have been one of the first times these people in their whole lives were ever completely satisfied. Can you imagine that? But it came through Jesus. It came through Jesus. But that wasn't all. Keep reading. We're almost done this morning. And what was left over was picked up. Twelve baskets of fragments, of, of broken pieces. Now, I want to remind you that Luke said there were 5,000 men, verse 14. Matthew adds in his gospel, Matthew 14, 21, there were 5,000 besides women and children. Now, scholars, we don't know exactly how many. But if you add the women and children, the wives, the mothers, the daughters, and the kids, right, of 5,000 men, scholars estimate between 10,000 and 20,000 people were fed with five loaves and two fish. Okay? What a miracle. What a miracle. Incredible. But I always think about weird stuff. I don't know about you guys. How many of you know that if Jesus wanted to, he could have exactly multiplied the exact number of loaves and the exact number of fish? Do you guys know that? He knew how much everyone was going to eat. That makes sense, right? He could have did it exactly. That there wasn't one thing left over. Now, when it comes to me again and, and my kids and my family, I don't like people who waste food. I don't. That's one of my pet peeves, right? 
I'm like, you better finish that food. I worked hard for that. You know, that, that, that's my mentality, right? I'm, a bit, I don't, I'm, a, I'm big on, you know, it's always one of those, you know, don't you know there's kids in Africa that don't have food? My kids are like, well, let's ship it to them. You know, that kind of thing. But Jesus here again, not only did he provide food to the satisfaction and full of everyone, but he also provided leftovers. Kind of interesting, huh? How much leftovers did he provide? What does it say? 12 baskets. How come 12? Could it be that he provided a basket for each one of his disciples? They had served. They had honored God. They had been used by God. And how many of you know God always blesses his people, right? He always blesses his servants. I love it. I think this is so awesome. I truly believe that there are so many people today who don't experience that that blessing of God because they never take the time to serve. But if we would be willing to get our hands dirty, if we would be willing to extend compassion, right? If we would be willing to, to give out that love that God has so freely given to us by being a blessing to others, I believe we would experience some of that same blessing that the disciples experienced that day. There's a lot of sheep out there without a shepherd, aren't there? Lord, help us to have that love of God in our heart, right? To take the time to minister to their needs just like Jesus did. Amen? Let's pray and prepare for communion. Once again, Father, we thank you this, this morning, Lord God, just for your great love for us. Thank you that you are there. Thank you that you are so compassionate, that you have provided for us, Lord. We are blessed. We are, all of us. Again, we might not be rich, but we are blessed, Lord. We have you. We have you. We have the hope of heaven. We have the forgiveness of sins. We have the promises of your word. Thank you, Lord. Let us be forever grateful. And I pray, Lord God, with our gratefulness, fill within us a greater love for people. Help us, Lord God, to think less about ourselves and more about others, Lord. That's how you were. That's how you are. And I pray, Lord, if we call ourselves Christians, that we would would be the same way. Thank you for your goodness in our lives, Lord God. Again, we could never pay you back for all that you've done for us, but we can pay it forward, Lord. Let us serve you. Let us serve others, Lord God. Thank you again, again, just for the truth of your word, Lord. Build us, change us. Help us to be the people that look more and more like your son, Jesus. Amen.